Good day, good day. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us once again. Um, this is Homeschool Your Kids podcast, and I am Jay. Today I have with me Miss April. Hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> How you feeling today? I am ready. I'm here and I'm ready to talk about homeschooling. Yes. Yeah, so introduce yourself. Tell us about your world. All right. Well, again, I'm April Jackson of Past Network and Past Network Foundation, and I host a micro school in Atlanta, Past Pod, and I'm also the co-founder of Black Micro Schools ATL, which right. is a collective of about 14 homeschool micro school communities that um, are founded by, that have Black founders and predominantly serve Black children. Mm. Beautiful, powerful. Yes. How did that begin? What what was the inspiration behind this this startup? Um, the startup of the organization. So I started micro schooling three years ago. And uh, when I came in, I found someone who was already doing it. And I was like, sis, can you help me? And she was like, yeah. And I'm going to send you kids and my kids because I, my area is middle school and most micro schools mm. start at that K through five yeah. range. And so um, she wanted somewhere for her middle school. So she sent me the kids, her kids, other kids, and I just started. But the community that I built with her, I was like, there should be a bigger community of this. So I just started going out to events. And when I would meet other micro school leaders, I was like, I thought I was doing something that was new and it was being done yeah. and I just wasn't connected. So anytime I would talk to someone, I would tell them we should work together. We should work together. Nice. And the power of one. And then we got two. And then we just called a meeting. Like, if you want to be a part of this, come on. We had six people. Then we have 14 now. And we are just. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. So, okay. Did you, cause I know you were an English teacher, which um, I remember that because, you know, I was an English teacher too. So, <laughs> but um, did you homeschool your own before you started the micro school? So I don't have any children of my own. Really? So okay. My kids are my babies. I just have always, it was a teacher that inspired me to become an educator. And I grew up um, in the hood and there was a lot of beauty to the hood but there was uh, a need to get out in order to impact within, right? right? So education gave me that vehicle and I wanted to do that. So I became a teacher, but I found inside of public education, you couldn't, um, you could not impact the change that you needed to because the average reading level for my ninth grade students was third grade reading level. Oh, say it. And in that particular high school, there was no reading teacher. How mm. are you justifying this? And so, um, and I would see with my children, they would say, just teach them on grade level. That'll be fine. Just add, just scaffold it, modify all of these things. I'm like, look, there's only so much modifications you can do for a child that doesn't understand blends and digraphs and all of that, you know? So, um, and when I asked a Black principal, could I embed more African-American literature in the curriculum? And he told me no. Mm. The next year I started my own school. Oh. That was it for me. Wow. wow. <laughs> Game changer. <laughs> like, oh, okay. Oh, okay. No problem. Don't even worry about it. Don't even worry about it. But it's amazing. And I, I, I'm a spiritual person. And so it's amazing how God just prepares you for that. So about two years before that move, though, I went back and got my math certification because I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this, but I want to leverage myself to be able to go wherever I want to go. So that prepared me because when I went in my micro school, I didn't have to hire all these other people to come in because I was ELA certified, which gave me a strength inside of history. And I was math certified, which gave me leverage inside of science. So I was able to, for the middle school child, be the sole educator for them. 
That is so dope. So, so dope. Oh, that is, that's awesome. And especially Thank coming you. from the angle you came from and understanding that your presence is needed and the difference is needed. And the, like you said, the traditional classroom don't offer that, that change that you, you think you're going to do when you become a teacher. It's like, you know, we have these visions coming a teacher I'm gonna change the world like you know, right. in my classroom this is gonna happen and all this stuff and then you get in there you like you in the middle of trying to teach uh <laughs> their eyes are watching God and they coming on their announcements can you send someone to the office why are you interrupting my learning with this like yes, children have a schedule use the child schedule call the child schedule. you know it was like all of the interruptions to the learning day um all of the unnecessary policies I, I absolutely hated uniform policies. I just didn't mm-hmm. understand so many things that had absolutely nothing to do with student Learning. achievement. Learning, yes, right? yes. So I teach three hours a day. That's it. After that, what we doing? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. What do you think, because you, you spoke on having ninth graders reading on a third grade level. What do you think the correlation is? Because I had 10th and 12th graders reading on a third grade level. What do you think that, how do you think that happened? I'm just your theory and how that how do you think that happens? I think that that um that transfer from third to fourth because that third is that spot, right? Third is where you and when you transition to fourth, that's when you stop from learning to read to reading to learn, right? Mm. So they, as they continue to go, they continue to learn to read, but they don't learn to read to learn. And nobody goes after fourth grade, nobody's going to go back and and try to work with you on fluency. No Mm -hmm. one's going to work with you on vocabulary building. And right now, our children are engaged in so much noise that does not help to elevate their vocabulary. Because you'll find with that eighth grader, ninth grader, 12th grader, they have a vocabulary gap, they have a fluency gap. But who's teaching that? I mean, um, you know, when we were growing up, I don't know how old you are, I'm 43, oh, but um, we did not curate what we watched. This is what came on television, and this is what you had to watch. So we were watching the shows that when we look back now, the vocabulary was a bit elevated. The ideas were elevated inside of here. Well, what are our children watching now? They're watching TikTok. They're watching YouTube. They're curating what they're watching. So what they're watching is not elevating them any because Mm -hmm. I don't have to watch the news. We had to watch the news. It was one TV in the house (laughs) and that's what it was on, you know? Um, So I think the lack of engagement in quality uh, communications Mm -hmm. um, is is now impacting our vocabulary. And we know there's a direct correlation to being able to read uh, fluently and uh, effectively and learn to and read for the purpose of learning and vocabulary yes because i was going to say comprehension like people be thinking like oh i know how to read these words but do you actually comprehend what you're you're reading are you are you bringing it in are you you know are you receiving that that whatever the message is that you're reading and most of the time it's not like the comprehension i feel is really really low right now it's very low, but I think where the homeschooler is because they're spending that time with that parent and that parent is just not going to talk on that third grade level with you. You're <laughs> going to have to rise up in this conversation because this is where we're mo- moving to. And so um, in the in the, uh, in the the traditional school now, they're trying to make it more culturally relevant, but somehow mm. culturally relevant to them means I'm going to throw in some slang here. I'm going <laughs> to put some rap in here, you know. And that's just not, you know, that's not it. And so you'll find English teachers that don't speak well anymore because Mm. now we're trying to be so culturally relevant. And I don't know why our culturally relevant, but I celebrate AAVE. Don't get me, don't get it wrong now. I love our African-American vernacular. I don't have, I'm not suggesting that, but I'm saying that we do have to emerge inside of there, those rigorous words, those, um, you know, so that our kids can have that exposure. Yeah, and be prepared. Like, because some kids' goals are to go to college. And with understanding that mindset, you have to be able to write and comprehend for college. Like, you have to be able to write on that level. Although colleges are kind of, like, dumbing it down, too. Like... They didn't have a choice. Yeah, I I know. And that's that's a sad thing. That's, that's really sad. 
Well, you know, not so much because we find that a lot that we're learning in college is, is still absolutely unnecessary, right? Of course. Yes. No. You know? Yes. But, I'm saying as far as the writing level and the things oh. like, because like I had, I got, I, I had ended my teaching in 12th grade English. Um, so I saw where my kids were as far as, okay, you about to be a freshman in college and you're writing like this. Like, that's what I mean. Like, it's wow. <laughs> like, right. And these these are the ones that honor society. You, these are not even the you're talking about poor writing among the high achievers. You're like, yes, ma'am. You have a 4.0 GPA and your sentence structure is horrible. It's poor. It's poor. Right. <laughs> right. Right. What's that? Thank you. Let's call it like it is. You know, like, what is this? And they're going to college. And that's because we have all these inflated GPAs. Mm. um that are attached to behavior and not true academic performance mm. but then even that is questionable though because you know what is what writing is absolutely necessary for me for life absolutely correct especially now like writing in general isn't even a thing it's typing and being able to get the sentence out enough that it can be corrected um because microsoft word corrects everything for you even grammar now so it is that that is a good question like what is necessary for success as far as what you're trying to achieve where you're going i teach my children you know i teach them how to write an email Mm, yes you know, I did that. Well, we used to teach how to write a friendly letter and a business letter how to write and fit a friendly email and a business email that's more relevant right yes because we're not going to write any letters anymore we're going to write emails what should be in the body of an email how do you add an attachment to an email you would be amazed at how many children will start writing the text of the of the message adults do that too girl in the subject <laughs> what Oh, yes. Yes. I've had that. (laughs) Yes, I've had that. I've had that. I've seen it a lot. Teach your child how how to write an email. Teach your child how to write an engaging social media post, right? Mm. Because they may be using social media for their personal. They may be using it for business. But how do you create engaging content? Teach them how to use chat GPT at this point. Yeah. I still need tutorials on that myself. I'm still getting it. But if our children don't know, even with chat GPT, you can't just copy paste and that's that. You have to know, no, this doesn't align with my branding and marketing. I need to tweak this language some. So they still need to know what they're reading to know what they want. Is this effectively saying what I want it to say? Is it yeah. connecting to my the emotion that I want to have and so forth? I love that. At your micro school, what's the ratio? What you looking at? Um, I take no more than 12 children. Okay. Um, because that's what I can handle by myself. Yeah. Um, and um, so it's 12 to 1. And this year is a lot of boys. Okay. I'm getting a lot more black boys. And I love that. Uh, right. I, I hear that I'm a black boy teacher. <laughs> you can't tell. I'm really cutthroat. <laughs> And so um, I don't tolerate a lot. And for me, I found that young ladies can find me a bit abrasive. Mm. Uh, but with boys, they just ignore it. And it's just like they, they're on to do whatever they're on to do. So nice. And you teach all the, are you teaching all subjects? Everything. I bring in support for Spanish. Okay. Um, I'll bring in someone for art. Um but for the mo- the core content, that all comes from me. That is dope. Like, I'm so, so inspired. So inspired. I'm not about to do it right now, but I'm very inspired. <laughs> Why are you not about to do it right now? Because we're traveling with the expo. And so okay. I'm not even stationary in general. If, like I said, I, I got a couple years to do this. Um, I feel like there's a few years in this for me. But after that, I definitely want to. My you know, my six and nine-year-olds talk about starting a school. So it don't be right if I, if I um, you know, set that right. tone for them. But yeah, just not right now. Not saying I'm not going to, but just not right, right now. Um, the assignment's different right now. Right. But what does PASS stand for? Parental access to student support. Okay. So we try to put the, we are a business. Mm-hmm. And we have to remember that we serve children, but our customers are the parents. 
got you. So I put, so this is providing parents access to the support they need for their students at home. And so that's where PASS came from. Nice. So how involved are the parents? This year is going to be the year that we cranking it up. So I got one of my parents, she's an educator. So I said, look, can you run my PTO this year? Um, And so this year I want them really involved. I want one parent a month to come in and teach a class, Um, whatever you have. So I have a a grandma mom that is going to be teaching my kids fishing this year. Um, and I have someone else, she loves to cook. So when she's going to come in and do a cooking class, and I just think that that creates a great relationship with the parent and the child. Um, but we t- typically serve families that may not have the flexibility to do it themselves. So we support them. Um, and they don't, they don't have a lot of flexibility in their schedule, but I welcome them. Come on in, sit in, do a class, whatever you need to do. Cause it, I want a community. It's 12 children and me. Yeah. Come on now. Come on over here. Whenever you want to, the doors, the sh- doors of the church are open. <laughs> I love that. That is so, that's awesome because that, that is what's needed. I, I love and support and I'm so happy to see the micro schools taking off like they are. I'm loving it. Cause when I tell you, when I talk to parents about homeschool, the first thing they ask me, but well, do you, can you teach my kid? Like I get asked that all the time, Right. all the time at the park, at the mall, everywhere. Like somebody, oh, oh yeah, no, that sounds real good. But do you teach? Right. Like, they want someone teach? else. Yes. Right now we are struggling to educate them on the visibility of these, you know, um, using consistent language because there's a marketing piece to this. So you have to use consistent language. Um, like I like tiny schools. I just thought that was so cute. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the language is micro schools. And so I had to change over my language, change it on the website. So there's consistency. Um, and also just spending the time in educating and not recruiting. Sometimes, because right. you are businesses and you do need to have so, so many children in those seats. But we have to know that we are also in the business of serving and educating, and we educated the whole family. So right now, we just want people to know that we exist, that we're here. Now, Arizona has been doing it for a minute, but here in Georgia, it's really just starting to pick up and take off. Yes, because Arizona, I know pods is a big thing there, um, the learning pods. Um, I just, I, I really commend the micro schools, the pods, just anything, the co-ops, anything that is downsizing what a traditional classroom setting is because kids are so underserved there. So, so underserved. Um, a one to 12 ratio is beautiful. I thought charter schools were like that. You know, I had, I had a rude awakening with charter schools. I'm thinking that they are sitting <laughs> here with 15 kids in the classroom whole time. They got 25 to 30, just like a regular school. And I'm just like, well, what, what makes it, what makes it a charter? <laughs> and, and, you know, it's not, it, the class size is significant. Uh, yeah. But they have, you know, there are there's some research, but you can find research that'll support one or the other. Some say that the class size, some research says class size is not the most significant, as significant as people think. Mm-hmm. I think the bigger thing is individualizing that instruction, and the class size allows for that, uh, the individualization of instruction. So I tell my parents, don't look for, do they have who has the fewer students? Look who. For instance, every morning I get up at 5 a.m. At my class, my school starts at 9. I get up at 5. And from 5 until about 7.30, I'm creating the learning plan for the day for children. Mm. Not the learning plan for the week or the month. I don't do lesson plans that extend that long. My lesson plans are day to day. Because if I saw that um, Jeremy couldn't uh, differentiate a dime for a nickel from a nickel, then for the next few days, I need to make sure that I embed some activity that will make him have to do that task. And that could change every day I'm seeing something different. So it's the individualization of instruction. Um, But when you talk about charter schools, so charter schools are just really public schools, right? And now everybody got a charter school. So the charter schools are constantly trying to recruit, recruit, recruit. So they are struggling with the same thing that public schools are. You're pulling from the public schools, right? So you got to try to convince them to come over there. Once you get them in there, 
you got to keep them in there so you can keep your funding. So now you are beholding to that child, beholding to that parent. And again, you're back to ignoring the teacher. Mm. Um, I've done the charter schools. I worked at charter schools in Louisiana. I worked in charter schools here in Georgia. And what has been the problem is that more and more charter schools are cropping up and it's degrading the quality of them because now they're competing with public schools and the other charter schools. Gotcha. You know, so charter schools, we thought were going to be the fix. They are not the fix, not for our children. And they're struggling with teacher retention, just like everyone else. Yeah. You know, so yeah, the, 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 this is where we're going. And this is improving teacher retention because here I am an educator. Before I did this, I tried corporate training and I just hated it. Oh, um, as far as like teaching other teachers? No, corporate training. So I was teaching nurses and social workers how to do oh. case management. Okay. I didn't have a background in it, but I had a background <laughs> in education. That's why right? I thought you were, yeah, that's okay. Right, no, I taught nurses and social workers how to do case management. And I tried to do that, but I just hated it because I missed my kids. I missed mm. the classroom. But a lot of teachers are saying, forget that, I'm leaving. I'll go and do that. That is not as emotionally rewarding for me, but it's financially rewarding. It's less stressful for me. Mm. So what micro schools is also doing is stopping the bleeding out of black educators from the field of education by giving them an alternative. That is so, that's beautiful because I, when I tell you guilt was like a thing with me, mm. um, stepping out and just, I tell people, like I share it all the time. Like when I first started teaching in my own classroom, I taught in seventh grade um at a, a title one school and my students were like low like they were low as far as grade level wise I had a young lady who I uh, share her story all the time but she was reading on a pre-k level like when she did the star reading test it suggested work on a pre-k level in the seventh grade and when I tell you I cried so much my first year of real realizing just like yo, we are really setting these kids up for failure. Cause then I had a reading specialist that would talk to me and mentor me through this process because I'm like, I, I can't fail her. Like, what am I failing her for? Because she's already made it here with that. So now I'm about to hold her back in the seventh grade to repeat what? And you know, right. it, was like, it was so, it was such a battle. It really is. Even with the 12th graders, I told you, I had 12th graders who could barely write a complete sentence who was still writing no, like I know something in O. So like, you know, with them reaching on that level, this young man had a job at Walmart. What? Like selling him and making him stay in public school another year to hold, to do what? Like, you know? That is powerful because that's what I try to tell people all the time. By the time they get to us is secondary educators. Yeah. Yes, we realize that they're on a third grade level. Yes, we try to close the gap as much as we can in that one year in our cloud crowded classroom without the adequate training to address their actual needs. Because think about it. If I'm a secondary reading te English teacher, I'm not a reading teacher. There's a difference. Yeah. I went through training uh, when I was an academic coach for language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling, which is letters is what they call it. That's when I learned the foundations of reading. I'm an academic coach by this point and I had no clue because mm -hmm. why? I'm a secondary educator. I went to school for English. I, my, my master's is in secondary ed. We don't do foundations of reading at that level. So the secondary educator is not even equipped to address the issues that that child has experienced because if she's pre-K, that she doesn't know her sounds. She doesn't know her blends. She doesn't know any of these things. So there yeah. is absolutely no way that a secondary education educator could truly help her. They don't have the uh, capacity and they don't have the time. Yes, so what am I going to do with this child? I'm going to put her on some audio and build her listening comprehension skills because that's all audio is doing let's let's tell the truth um they like to make you believe that you know put them on audio and that's the fix for that yeah problem. i would say yeah a band-aid <laughs> a band-aid on a scar you broke your right. leg put a band-aid on it now they just have greater listening comprehension they do not have greater reading comprehension by doing that so 
but you don't have the ability. So again, what are we going to do with them? I'm not about to hold you back. I'm just not going to do it. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to try to give you some tools for life so that you can navigate in a world where you cannot truly read and comprehend. And I'm going to, again, pray that the next person can move you just a little bit more, just a little yeah, bit more. The forward progress is everything for me. Even now, you know, as a homeschool, that's what I talk about, forward progress, understanding that it's not necessarily a standard that you need to reach. It's just moving them forward in general, like meeting them where they're at and moving them forward. And I feel like I definitely learned that being, <laughs> being in that school um, and just seeing like, yeah, no. And that's why I'm saying, like, I had a lot of guilt with leaving my students behind. And if it wasn't for the shutdown, I probably would have still been teaching, honestly, truth be told. Um, because I had so many students always tell me, oh, I can't wait to have your class next year, Ms. Carter. I can't wait to be in your class. Like, you know, like, I have heard that constantly. And so every right. year I'm just like, oh, okay, I'm going to be here. And I, like those, like you said, those are your babies. Like I told them, I, I just had um, a student text me yesterday. She went into labor. One of my former students, um, 20 years old, she having her first child and she texted me and I had to screenshot it because I, I need to remember this because I really want to go back to a vision that I had as far as helping young mothers because what she said was, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Um, I don't even really know how to change a diaper um you know things of that nature and I'm just sitting there I'm sending her paragraphs like understand first of all know that I'm here ask any question you need anytime please know that and lean into your support system she her mom was there with her she has other you know support I lean into them but it's just like yeah. those are your babies like I consider myself like a girl I got grandkids now like wow. I, have, I have a couple kids that don't have kids but it's just hearing and seeing where they're at with things and knowing like they're not prepared as you would like them to be. Um, it's it's discerning. It's 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 hurtful. It but then parents, you know, I think um, you know when we talk about homeschool now, parents imagine pandemic, mm. and they imagine that it looks like that. And you're oh, in yeah, it, yeah. you're in there struggling. You don't know what to do. Um, they don't really know how to go out and find the resources to help them be able to help their children. They may feel like they don't have the time to do that and so forth. And we really need to let parents know there are so many ways that this can look. And I tell you what, it won't hurt you to say for six months, a year, we're not going to do anything but learn from the world around us. Yes, de-school. Just take time things. take time to just take reimagine time. yes reimagine because what it looks like when you homeschool you can catch that time back up don't worry mm -hmm. about that year if you can if you have that flexibility you know the problem is a lot of parents don't have that flexibility to keep the child at home or they need the personal break you know Mm -hmm. um but that's why the micro schools are dope though like because right. a lot of parents do see the problem in traditional school they do see like okay I want to change this I, I need my child to be somewhere else however I can't take on that right now I can't take on that that responsibility or that task to be their full-time educator however I can have I can reach out to April <laughs> April right. has a micro school <laughs> Like, right, right. But then th that parent, you know, like you all are lucky there because you all have the scholarship or ES ESEA. Oh, in Arizona, uh, you know, yes. Yeah, you all are lucky to have that. But then you're in a state like Georgia where they don't have that. So then how do I afford it? Um, mm -hmm. Like right now, I'm looking, I've got to find me $15,000 in grants because my heart was so big. And I was like, okay, come on, you, you don't fix income. This is what you got. Okay. I'm going to find the money here. Bring your child on, you know, yes. just bring the child on. So now I've given out $15,000 that I got to find by somewhere means, but also like when you're in somewhere where you just cannot afford that option, you know, mine is only four fifty for part-time and five fifty for full-time. Okay. When you think about the cost of private schools here being well over a thousand dollars, some of them $36,000 a year to go to a private school here. So it's, we're cheap. Yeah, but definitely. You, you ain't got it. Yeah, you know? I, yeah. In the, the time that we it. in, it, it is a lot of don't got it. Believe it's, me, it's a lot of don't got it. You know, so um, we have to start thinking about how are we going to fund these. You know, because 
I'm coming out of Atlanta public schools um, or its surrounding schools, and I could easily make almost uh, $80,000, $90,000 if I just go back in the classroom, right? Um, but I am now living well below that in order to do this micro school. So we've got to figure out how to fund these programs in places where the funding is not coming in. And even think about, even if you are running a school, I don't know, how much is your ESEA in Arizona? I want to say it's seven, 7,000. Okay, then if we do the math on that, uh, let's say you got 20 kids. It's say you got 10 kids in there, right? And you, you're the only staff. Because once you start getting above about 15 kids, you need some help. Yes. But you're the only staff in there. If you got 15 kids, you're at 105 a year, approximately $105,000 a year. To run the programs, though, it takes about 150000 Mm. You know, to give yourself a living wage, and I'm in Atlanta, to give yourself a living wage. So even if you got the full $7,000 for each child, you still are falling short $45,000 a year to make these, for these programs to run, you know, gotcha. you know, so we've got to really talk about, and we need these bigger organizations like Urban League and NAACP and, you know, just other black organizations to start directing money into these schools because mm. if not we're going to continue to lose teachers to other fields and then we're going to turn around and who's going to be teaching our children because no, they ain't I coming down like here to them. teach our kids they yeah. ain't coming out I, you know I, you don't know that i don't know if you know atlanta well but they're not coming out cleveland ave in atlanta mm -hmm. you know they're not coming to college park to teach our kids right so I was used to sub in a school in this area when I first got started. There were eight vacancies in that one building. Mm. Eight vacancies in that one building. Our teachers are leaving. Yes, they are. They are leaving. So if we don't start finding ways to fund programs like this that are not government-based funding, we've got to fund these as a community. But yes. we're so stuck on, you know, they defund in public education. Well, how has public education been working for you? That's my thing. Like, and then especially like we have to speak on that um real, real quick. Because my thing is like you talk to the the hotel brothers, you talk to the the um just a bunch of individuals that speak on like, oh, the system this and the system that. And then you ask them where their kids go to school at and they be like, oh, they go to the uh, <laughs> public school <laughs> up the street. Like, how does that work? Um, I asked, and a lot of parents aren't even familiar with the whole prison, the pipeline, um, the pipeline to prison, public school pipeline to prison um, theory or it's not even a theory Reality. at this point yeah i about to say yeah because it's been proven time over um a bunch of research has been put placed into that but a lot of parents haven't even heard of that so i do question and ask that question like well what are you doing to make sure your child doesn't end up down that pipeline because we as a whole understand that the public school system does not serve us in our best like you don't have to be in the public school system to know that like you don't i, I knew that before i got there um but being there wholeheartedly, I, I ask that question all the time. What are you doing to make sure your child doesn't end up down that pipeline? Because we know that there's an issue with the public school, but yet it's right. like people say, oh, just send them there. And it's like, that's 13 years. Do you understand what you've given away when you give your child to that system? Years. That's right. 13 years. But they don't even know that these other options are there because anytime we start making a little noise, we start getting knocks on our door. You're running an illegal program in here. You know, we start, you know, they'll start putting step stipulations and funding to where a lot of our programs don't get the funding because we're not accredited, you mm -hmm. right? So they start putting stipulations in place. When we, it, as they see this movement happening, they're going to start putting poll taxes. That's what I call it. Anytime they start making legislation that, secretly is designed or not so secretly designed to hinder the black growth in that sector. I call them the poll taxes, literacy tests, yeah. right? They're going to start put those, putting those stipulations in place for us. And, um, but we, that's why we have to stop relying on the system to fund everything that we're doing, right? Yes. 
Um, I, like you gonna, said, there's some big organizations that have the funds. They have and the they money. They put to money support. in education, but they don't put money in us doing our own education. You know, I'm not even going to call out this organization right now because I got a grant that I, I, I wrote for them. So I want it and I want, <laughs> well, I want that money still. But I'm going to tell you this year, you know, I put in for this $50,000 grant with this organization. Um, um, and we were supposed to find out about the grant on June 30th, whether or not we were going to receive it. Yeah. It is June, July 27th. Yeah. Right. They told us on June 30th. You, you'll know something in about two two weeks. It's July 27th now. They still ain't told us. We've been waiting on them folks to just tell us yes or no. We don't even know we're getting the money. Just I to know. tell us yes or no. And when I saw that happen, I said, never again will I wait on them to fund my educational business. So I started looking at my business model. I said, okay, let me take this down. Right now, 100% of my revenue is coming from uh, tuition. I've got to find a way to take that down to 65% or 50% mm. and figure out another revenue stream for my micro school so that I'm not reliant on grants, which no business should rely on grants. And I'm not willing for, I'm not waiting on anyone outside of my community to fund what I'm doing to serve my community. Got you. You know, yeah. um, but we get, we've got to start, but I think a lot of people just don't know that we're here. Yeah. They don't know it's an option. Yes. And then the, people get in their ear and they start telling them, oh, it's got to be accredited. And it's like, if your child is in kindergarten, tell me why they need to go to an accredited, an accredited kindergarten. <laughs> I really have people call me and ask me, is your program accredited? Accredited for what? Your child is in the third grade, ma'am. Nobody is asking these questions. You know, but that's a, that's the bounce between it's like people. Okay. Do you want to be a part of the system or do you want to be a part of the system? It's like, it's a pro, it's a deep programming of how things have to look. Um, Cause I had someone tell me that I needed to get accredited with like my app and doing all this stuff. And I'm just like, hold on, we speaking two, two totally different, inf- like we not on the same page at all. We're right. not um, wholeheartedly. I'm not trying to, or I'm not removing myself from a system to enter into a different type of system or like put myself in a, still a structural system. That's not what I'm doing. Um, Oh no, that's not the freedom. That's not the free part. But they put us in this box. The more and more they seem like they're giving us the freedom, then they'll do something to snatch it away. So for instance, what they're going to do with ESEA here, I'm willing to bet in the next two or three years, it'll happen here in Georgia, no problem. Yes. Well, what they're going to do is they're going to do something crazy like, oh, if you're a micro school, homeschool program or what a co-op, you have to be accredited in order to get the funding, right? And so then they're going to require me to have that government act, you know, Stand, enter into yeah. my business in order to do it. And then we have to choose then, well, what are we going to do then? Are we going to go back into another system or are we going to stand at our ground and we're going to stay at where we cannot, we are barely supporting ourselves in order to do this work. That's why organizations like, like I said, like Urban League, like the Black Chamber of Commerce, like, you know, these organizations that do have money, they need to start setting aside money to support these programs and sustainability funds, not mm. funds that say, I'm going to give you a $10,000 grant one time. Mm -hmm. They need to say, we're going to commit to $25,000 a year for five years as you develop your program out until you can build the the recognition. Because think about it. We don't even have marketing budgets. Yeah, no, I understand. Who's who's doing your marketing Girl, my budget real, real slim right now. And you know, I'm a I'm a whole 501 out here and I'm still like trying to figure out how that funding comes about. Cause like you said, I am dependent on grants right now. Um, look, I sent out the donation uh emails and texts to family and friends and you know where they asked you to um to what suggest you start. And they, that didn't render much. Um, I got the donate button on my website, all that stuff. And I tell people quick, I'm a team of me. Like I, I say we all the time, we as an organization, but it's me. Like, it's me. 
<laughs> it's me. But I think we've got to start working collectively to go for those bigger dollars so that we can do that. Um, that's where Black Micro Schools Institute comes in. So Black mm. Micro Schools ATL is the founding chapter of Black Micro Schools Institute, which we're building out now. So it'll be, uh, we are looking at what revenue streams are we going to build in and then be able to, our goal is to, you know, over the next decade or so, be able to give those sustainability grants to Black educators. You want to come out, you want to start a micro school, let's give you your startup funds. Yeah. You know, you go through our training program and we're going to give you $10,000 to start up with and we're going to guarantee you $10,000 for five years. You know, we need, those are the type of grants we need. It's not those one-off grants. We are spending so much time applying for $5,000, $10,000 grants. Yes, ma'am. No. Oh, you you are absolutely correct. You are right. absolutely correct. And if I have um, a grant program in my plans, in my business plans also for the nonprofit. And that's tra helping families transition to homeschooling. And I wanted to offer between a, a five to $10,000 grant where it allows them to be able to establish maybe a home business, establish something that is going to bring them income so that they're comfortable with the transition, um, even using it with that's funds awesome. or whatever. That's that's a goal, you know. I, I'm, I'm, too. I know it, I know it, um, but I, I agree that, and I didn't think about the sustainability of it all, like understanding like, no, this doesn't need to be a one-time thing. And you see that with foundations, like the big foundations that are out there, they have grants that do re like are reoccurring grants. Right. Um, so it's, it's definitely possible. And I wish that people who talk as much as they talk about things and wanting to like you know identifying the problem of things because I feel like everybody could talk about the problem all the time but it's like okay right. well what's what you doing with the solution like what's your part with the solution because y'all got it a lot of these organizations have it and I reached out to a lot of people with doing this expo honey and I tell you I'm still doing all this out of pocket on my end so um yeah, no, nah, the, the response is be real, real slim. <laughs> well, and that's where, um, which you all have down there, I see that collective Black Micro Black Moms Forum. Mm -hmm. I think it's an organization that's in the Arizona area that um, that re they really work together. Uh, and I, I, I watch them all the time because I'm like, okay, that's the community. That's the community that I want to build. Um, but I think we're going to have to kind of go in collectively and not independently. You know, yeah. when I'm talking about my 10 kids over here, that doesn't sound like much to a big organization. But when I talk about 14 organizations that are serving yeah. over 500 children, you know, or 250 children, now we're talking about you are an organization. So that's why I said, let's come together and form another 501c3. We have our independence. Let's form a bigger that is the collective of all of the micro schools working together. And so I that's like that. what we want to try to go for the bigger dollars. Um, because if we got 10 schools and we got a $250,000 grant. Yeah, I got it. Everybody yes. can get 25000 right? Yes. And that could pay your rent for at least a year. Like for me, my rent is only $600 a month. Yes. So with me only paying six hundred dollars a month, twenty five thousand dollars pay my rent for about two years. Yes, you know, yes. and so, that's that's a lot. That, that's like, a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. So we that's where we have to go in order for this to be sustainable. Because what we don't want is a lot of micro schools popping up, coming down, popping up, coming down, mm -hmm. and then families are not going to want to put their children in these places because they're unstable. Unstable, yeah. Right. So we've got to figure out how we can be stable. And we also probably have to, to slow the play, pace of growth mm -hmm. and really get a model that works. Yeah. Right. Then like everybody can't be, we can't keep, we got 20, we're going to open 20 more, but the 20 we got are still not sustainable. Mm. How do we get a real business model? It's like selling lip gloss. Somebody making money off lip gloss. So you say, I'm going to sell lip gloss too. Now everybody's selling lip gloss and ain't nobody making money. <laughs> yeah. You know? So we really got to get to a place where we say, no, we're not trying to, we're not trying to build more. We've got enough. Like in Atlanta, we've got enough. Mm -hmm. let's just try to get the ones, what's the business model that is successful? 
that's going to keep them the doors open that are not attached to grants yes so you know you know, i try no, to think just, i'm an educator but i'm business minded no i love it i love it because i'm just i'm just a passionate person that just acts on passion and i have a, a business person who who keeps me focused like okay but you gotta do this you gotta do this you gotta do this um because it is a business at the end of the day it is something that you want to be sustainable you want it to last longevity wise um because you want parents to have solutions that's what I'm it all here, comes here. down to yes and resources like you said a lot of parents don't know about these resources and that's why I um, make it a point to invite individuals that are providing these resources to the podcast because when I say homeschool your kids, it's it's beyond just the whole take your children out of school and send them, you know, bring them home with you and you don't know what to do. Like, no, I want you to know that you have help. You have, right. you, there's plenty of, there's plenty, plenty, plenty of resources, communities, co-ops, micro schools, organizations that are willing and able to help you reach the goal that works for you and your family. Um, right. Because it is no one way to do this learning. It really right. isn't. And don't be af afraid to invest in your children. You know, uh, you say you don't have the money for it, but then you're doing this and that. And I don't like the myth that oh, they got their children in Jordans, but they won't pay for school. Some of them don't have their children in Jordans. That's not yes. what they're living like. They're not living that lifestyle, but they also are not trimming the fat so that they can make the investment. And yeah. so not only do, you know, we want to have this option, but parents have got to start to say, I've got to make this sacrifice. You know, I've got to make this sacrifice. Needs it's, versus wants. Right. We've got to do that a little bit more. Trim, if you can, don't take your light bill money, <laughs> but, you know, but do trim where you can. You don't need a Netflix account. I found a hundred or so dollars in my budget a few weeks ago from trimming off subscriptions, mm. right? So if you could put $100 back in your budget to buy educational resources for your child every month, yes. do it. Yes, That's your resources. Yes. And you know, you homeschool, you know it don't cost that much. Oh yeah, no, I do it for free. <laughs> right, right. But yeah, no, um, we we are definitely a uh, whole unschooling freestyle. I just call it freestyle. Um, <laughs> we we do we do what we do over here, definitely. Because I I've been in the school system. I know that's not the model that I wanted to bring home. Nor do I I encourage anyone else to bring that model. Um, and understanding that learning happens all day. So we don't restrict learning to a time or a place like because my kids are definitely in my ear continuously about let us do this. Can we do this? Can we do a science experiment? Can we go outside and collect dirt and do this? Like they're always asking me the, the most puzzling questions that I look up because right. I don't know at all. Um, <laughs> not even a point. I tell people like they, you know, you know, people put you on a pedestal or something because you got a degree or whatever the case may be. And I, I always, I'm quick to tell them, please understand that I know 0. 0.000000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, however many numbers you want to put of information that there is in this lovely universe that we live in. I don't know nothing. And I'm continuously learning, continuously growing with my kids at home with me. This is a, a, a gang thing. We do this together. Like I call them gang all the time. <laughs> Need to now stop you, doing that <laughs> before I get a RICO job. <laughs> right. <laughs> do you um, teach parents how to shift their mindset to do what you do? Because I think one of the struggles is, is that parents um, often because they're coming, they came out of traditional public school, their kids have been in there and they don't even, their mindset shift that they have to go through. Like I, I say, you probably need six months a year. Leave, yes. if you leave them in there, if you want, and you start working on you build mm -hmm. your capacity yeah. or you spend that year where you pull them out and you do nothing and you just build your muscle up. Yes. And then that next year is your year to go in and, and have school like you want it. Yes. You got to pour into you. That's the trick to, to it all. Like this whole homeschool thing in general, you got to be good. <laughs> like if you're not good, then, then they're not going to be good. Cause your energy is everything and they feed off you continuously. 
um kids know when you you're not feeling right kids know when you, when the vibe is off or when you're not the you want your kids to want to be around you so I continuously worked on me I had to decompress and de school and de everything after I stopped teaching because I was carrying a lot with me in that regard I told you guilt was real heavy on me like right. just for me even stepping out of the classroom itself but I took that time to work on me I took that time to pour into me I, I continuously still take that time to pour into me because right. health like it starts with you it really does and you want them to like want to be around you so yes I do I offer um well that's the point of these expos too you know um the homeschool your kids expo it's about introducing self-care practices introducing healing um methods just un helping parents understand you don't have to have it all figured out but you got to know and be able to reflect on what it is that you want to or need to work on because when I hear people tell me oh I don't have the patience for something it's like okay well what you trying to do to grow to have the patience because you don't have to be stuck there like you know a lot right. of people put themselves like oh, I can never do that but you can though you can there are you no can. limits there's no limits to any of this I try to tell them, you know, like, think of what it is. Some, one of the other mistakes I see parents make is do the wrong thing first. And so then they, that's what they believe is the thing that homeschooling is. And so that's why they don't do it. You may not be a de-schooling mom. Like you may not ever be able to de-school. You may feel like you may be the person that always needs to have your child in something that is structured because that just makes you feel at ease right um and so as you kind of behind the scenes try to build that muscle up to that de-schooling mindset go ahead and put them in a micro school or a hybrid yes. school you yeah. know don't do a co-op if you don't want to sit there with your child <laughs> you know what i'm saying like you know you want a place where look i don't mind my child being at home most of the time but about two or three days a week i need a break yes i need yeah. a break you know, some people don't have that any other network. So if that child wasn't at school, I work from home. If my child wasn't, if my child's at home with me all day, they don't have anywhere to go in the evening. They don't have anywhere to go on the weekend. They're always with me. Then you are not a true homeschool parent. Because I know you know your children with you how often? All the time. They all, all the time. time they got but look they're they're not with me at this current moment they are spending two weeks and this has felt like the longest two weeks ever I don't like I, I low-key miss them a lot but <laughs> um I, I'm grateful for it they're with their dad in Virginia where when we leave out um on Friday to go to Baltimore we're stopping in Virginia to pick them up because they gotta you know rejoin the, the movement but yeah. um yeah, it's it's been a long, but it's been a needed two weeks because, like you said, like we are together all the time, all right. the time. My, it was funny because I was just on Facetime with my youngest yesterday, and she, uh, she was like, "Where are you?" I said, "I'm in South Carolina." She said, "You left us?" Like, yo, y'all been. I was just hanging in Virginia. You thought I was just hanging right. out like around the corner or something. Right. So you called and checked on me. Like, <laughs> but it was just funny. She was like, "You left." but How yeah <laughs> but that I, I love them wanting to be around me I love them like liking me like they right. my children adore me and I tell people that all the time but that comes with me making sure I am the best version of me for them like right. and that comes with work like you know conscious work conscious effort on my part to pour into me and hey fade back sometimes like Oh, this is this right. is necessary. Yeah, I think I think it's so important that parents find the right fit. And I, I wonder if there's a tool that we can give them to help them to like, do you have a tool where a parent can take a self-assessment? That would be nice. Um, that's something to think about. You know, I have the homeschool your kids app where it's just like, I have a lot of things up there that talks about self-care. I got a lot of things up there that um, just directs parents in general to help in as an overall. I got a long listing of blogs, podcasts, um, consultants, just a lot of things that help parents to see like, okay, this isn't a journey I have to do on my own. And this is a starting place for this journey. Right. But um, a tool itself, um, no. And that's why I feel like I, I, 
the once again the expos i wanted to go around and let people see and feel this energy and understanding like how free this can be for you and this is talking from a former 14 year public school teacher right. i don't use a curriculum i don't write lesson plans i don't do any of that stuff because i did not see it benefiting any of the kids that i came across in the school system so no that isn't something that i brought home with me and my girls like you talk to them you'd be like you could tell like i've been telling my my oldest she's nine I used to tell people, I'd tell her when she was six months, yo, use your words. I don't know what you're saying. Right. <laughs> so I, I, I always know. talk to my kids. My students used to trip out um, because she would come to work with me on the little bring your daughter to day work or whatever. And they're just like, yo, you talk to her just like you talk to us. And, you know, I'm working with middle and high school students. And they're just like fascinated to see that because there ain't no Google guy guy. You know, oh, are you OK? Like. Oh, right. no, like, no, I don't that. dumb down anything, big things. Like, and you, if they're not, they don't know something. They ask me, well, what does that mean? What, what, what does that word be? And I will gladly give them the definition. Like, you know, it's not, it, I'm elevating them at, at all times, always um, growing them in the direction to be their greatest selves. Like independence is key, honey, as far as little people, like parents be asking, well, what can I do to have less stress? teach your children to do things for themselves right <laughs> stop thinking you stop thinking you got to do everything for them right like, oh uh, my girls would get up and cook their own breakfast okay they would get up <laughs> and then also stop trying to parent in the way that works for you mm. and parent the way that child needs because you may have one that is thriving for that independence and the next child needs a little bit more uh, guidance and so and it's stressing you trying to fit both of your children into this no mode one. of yeah. I need both of y'all to act like this because this <laughs> is what works for me yeah and that's also stressing the child out when you're doing the compare and contrast and telling well well she's able to do this why can't you do that don't do that don't do don't that do it. don't <laughs> waste your time like that but yeah. you know I think uh, um uh, parents in general would benefit a lot more from parents in classes and not because they're bad parents, but just how to be better parents. No, understanding. Yes, I told you how my student has is texting me out of fear, like of not knowing what's next. Like I'm about to get sent home with this baby. And it's like, oh, I'm about to have this whole baby. Right. <laughs> I'm about to have whole baby. Yeah, what am I supposed to do? So I, I totally agree parents in classes. And that's, I told you the vision that I, I've had for a while since, um, being in the public school system, I definitely feel parenting classes are necessary. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So as we wrap up, give me, because you've already been given, but give me three, three, um, three things you would like to leave homeschool families with or thinking about a homeschool families or wherever they are with this whole process. Um, three, three things you would like to leave them with. You can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, no matter what your family structure is, when, no matter what your work schedule is, you can do homeschooling. It just may look different for you. Um, we can do this as a community, right? Um, you don't have to do it alone. We can do this as a community. Don't think, well, we can't do this. You know, we always limit out what Black folk can do. Mm. Black folk can do it too. That ain't a, it's not a white thing. Homeschooling no. is not a white thing. Um, and the last thing I would say to anyone is um, look at what your child is experiencing now and ask yourself, are you happy? Mm. With your child's education right now, are you happy with what they experience? Do you feel confident that your child is going to be prepared for the future? And if you are not happy as a parent, where you're sending your child every day. Maybe it's not homeschool, but what where it's got to be somewhere. Yeah. You you gotta be happy as a parent, but you're sending your child every day. Indeed, indeed. Thank you for that. And you're tell welcome. us uh, where can we find more information about your micro schools? How we get in contact with you. Well, people tend to like my Instagram. So <laughs> uh <laughs> Um, I'm always uh, cutting up and putting good, good information on there. So it's pastnetwork.org, uh, 
Pass Network Org. So P-A-S-S Network Org on Instagram. And of course, my website is passnetwork.org. Okay, cool, cool. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I love what you're doing. I love <laughs> you, what you're doing. You. Thank you for this opportunity. I love to be able to talk about micro school. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And parents, please continue to believe in yourself. Continue to trust the process. Continue to be the change. Continue to think outside of that box that they want to hold you in because you are greater and bigger than all of that. So do what works for you and your family. Every family is different. Um, Understand that there is plenty of resources and you do not have to do it alone. But homeschool your kids. (laughs) 